Tater timekeeper today. Uh, for those of you that went on last week, sorry if I'm looking slightly off camera. I've got a problem with um, one of my my laptop screens, so I have to look at the main screen most of the time. Um, format for those of you that was here last week is going to be much the same. Um, we're going to run through a few little bits of admin, and then I'll hand over to Warren King, the president of the Grasslands, just to say hello, and then we'll get straight into the speakers. The main thing that because this is a virtual conference and obviously the question and answers are um, one of the most valuable things at, at conference and we don't have that we're going to use slido for those of you that were here last week hopefully you'll remember how to use that we'll have the the slide come up in just a minute there's a qr code so if you scan that with your phone if you don't have the app um, or even if you've got the app that'll take you through to our slido account our slido page for this um, conference today and you can do two things in there. You can put your questions in, um, but you can also see other people's questions and give them a, a thumbs up if you want to vote for them and, and send them through. So the QR code will disappear, and we heard this last week, but in the chat here on Zoom, you'll be able to see the URL as well and just type that in or click on it and it'll take you through and you can join us. So while we're at the moment, and I see a few are already into it, Here's your chance, just for those of you that haven't used it before, tell us where you're watching from today. Not the room in your house or your office, but the location, I guess, um, where you are in New Zealand and flick that through. And we're starting to get a few coming in there as well. So plug that in while you're going. And what I'm going to do as that ticks along is hand over to the president of the Grasslands Association, Warren King, just to say a few words, welcome you along, and then he'll introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Warren. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, kia ora tato. My name is Warren King. I'm the president of the New Zealand Grasslands Association. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this, the second half of our 82nd online conference. Uh, of course, this is the, the first time we have not met face to face in an annual conference since 1946, a measure of the, 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 the crazy year we're having. Um, it's a mixed mode event. So we've got a combination of some pre-recorded material uh, and some uh, live stream stuff, but also uh, some Q&A as well. So hopefully um, all of that collectively will give a, a quite a nice um, rhythm to what is one of the key purposes of uh, the New Zealand Grasslands Association, which is to foster progress and encourage collaboration in all matters pertaining to grasslands. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm really very grateful for your, uh, for your attendance and for your feedback as well. Um, while we may not choose to have another conference online, as I choose, um, and I hope that we don't have to, uh, to, to do another full conference online, but we will use this platform in future, I think, for, uh, for some specific purposes. So your feedback is, is uh, really very valued by us. Um, I just want to say, uh, before we kick off, a couple of uh, thank yous. So thank you to our sponsors in, in particular. Our, our family of sponsors have, um, I mean, they've had a, a very turbulent year themselves, of course, and for them to uh, to remain staunch supporters of NZGA, I think, is, uh, is, is really important for us, and we're really very grateful. Um, it's only through their support that we can continue to do what we do. Uh, also, thank you to the members, um, many of whom will be uh, online um, and your continued support and your continued membership if you uh, need to renew it you might like to think about that um, but your continued support is again um, um, hugely important to us and really means we can continue to, to deliver good stuff um, and just a note to uh, any non-members you are um, of course very welcome uh, online this afternoon um, and if you uh, think we are delivering uh, uh, content of value to you then perhaps you might like to consider a, a membership as well. So uh, thank you and um, welcome one and all. It's uh, my privilege to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, uh, Sue Bidrose. So Sue is currently the chief executive of, uh, of AgriSearch. Um, she is relatively new to AgriSearch. Uh, she is also relatively new to agriculture. And uh, I, I'm particularly um, keen. This is why I asked Sue to, uh, to be one of our keynote speakers is because sometimes um, it's good to get a, a fresh set of eyes uh, and a fresh set of thoughts just in terms of uh, the, the lie of the land in terms of the future of agriculture. Um, Sue, of course, uh, was previously the chief executive of Dunedin City Council um, at, a, at a particularly turbulent time there as well with some challenging people and some challenging issues there as well. But um, enough from me. Sue, over to you. Thanks very much, Warren. I'm assuming you can hear me. Great. Uh, so 
very much for inviting me along. The, um, the person who works in this sector who probably knows the least about this sector, so I apologise in advance for those of you that are expecting profound words of wisdom. Um, I am um, sorry I wasn't able to be here last week. I am a member, so um, I am here also as a member, and I'm looking forward to today. Um, uh, a little bit about my history, I thought today is probably useful just to briefly introduce myself and say who I am. Um, and what I bring to the role, I, I started out my working career actually as a laboratory technician working for one of Ag Research's predecessor organisations at Wallaceville at the Animal Research Centre. I worked in a few different areas, but primarily I worked in looking at the um, magnesium and calcium deficiency in dairy cattle, uh, grass stags and milk fever. Um, so, you know, when that's your first job out of school, you kind of watch that business and that industry for the rest of your life. And I've been intrigued to watch how both the sector and, uh, and ag research itself coming into being and then watching the various machinations um, going on. Um, from there, so I was there um, in the very late 70s and through to the mid 80s. From there, I moved into the not-for-profit sector and decided to go to university. I was going to do clinical psychology, but elected instead to do a, to do a research qualification, did my doctorate um, in psychology, uh, but with a very strong, um, um, at, at heart, I suspect, I'm a statistician rather than a psychologist, so a very strong thread of teaching statistics, came pretty close to doing my doctorate in statistics, actually. Uh, but ended up doing it in psych, uh, but a strongly um, quantitative research background. Um, from there, I moved into the government sector and worked uh, for my, my PhDs in impact of trauma on children's development. So I went and worked for the then equivalent of Child, Youth and Family, worked in the research unit, ended up being the deputy manager of the research unit and then the, the manager moved into policy, moved into frontline operational service delivery management. Um, uh, and I enjoyed working in government. I worked with Ray Smith, actually, quite a lot. He was at Working Income when I was there. Um, working Income was part of Ministry of Social Development. He's a, he's a good guy. I know him well. I've got a lot of time for him. Um, so I have already met with him uh, in this role and, and will enjoy working with him more as the Ministry for Primary Industries really uh, starts to be very clear about wanting to see a, a roadmap for science in the primary sector, which I think has got to be good for all of us. Um, and then from Wellington, I moved into local government and um, enjoyed that. Uh, so I have a fairly good appreciation for the kind of regulatory impost that both central and local government uh, can put on the sector and some of the difficulties well, I understand why they do it, and now I'm starting to get a sense of some of the difficulties that that leaves um, this sector with from time to time. So that's going to be interesting, navigating my way through that. In terms of a vision for agriculture, for ag research, it's probably a little early, realistically, for me to be laying out my vision for ag research. But there's a few things um, I think I'd be just a bit arrogant if, um, if I thought that I was able to do that already. Um, however, there are a few things that are non-negotiable that are really clear. Um, you know, there's some things that set the groundwork for that thinking for me. The firstly is in this post-COVID environment, of course, um, uh, uh, the primary sector um, is once again our number one export earner, and that puts us in a pretty strong position. And, um, and in a way that's very good for me, um, uh, science has been really at the front of how we've tackled COVID, uh, despite losing that tourism sector and us us again being so strong and so predominant in New Zealand, um, the the uh, the role of science in responding the way we have and in being successful relative to many other places, I think puts us ag research well and people's view of science and the importance of science. It's nice to come here um, at that point in time, but despite being the number one export earner. This is the pastoral sector is one with, you know, facing some pretty tough challenges, uh, whether you're talking about climate change or in New Zealand in the way we treat um, farming and the way we talk about uh, farming and the, the, the difficult um, environmental issues that are around farming that we're all working to deal with. Um, New Zealand has value clean water. We've got, uh, we've got, 
a lot of thinking and work to do about bringing in some of the wisdom of a Matauranga Māori, vision Matauranga approach to the way that we, we uh, interact with our land. Um, we know we've got changing consumer trends and all of this sets the context, but despite that, the farming systems that are centred on forage remain absolutely key and central to the New Zealand economy. And for me, it's really exciting to be um, to be working in this sector, you know, and to, and to know that to be the truth and, um, and what better job could a girl have. Um, so, so ag research exists to provide uh, science-backed intel, if you like, evidence, facts, uh, some of the foundation science and then some science that is really good for making an impact, um, tools for the sector. Look, I, you know, those external things I talked about that made that made farming and pastoral farming tough, um, there's internal things we do that make it tough as well. So the regulatory system that I mentioned earlier um, sometimes can be, uh, I know, enormously difficult um, to, to navigate. And I mean, we've run our own farms and I'm seeing some of the, the recent water changes and the impact of thinking about that in terms of our own farms. And, and so what, the, what is that like for um, people out in farming, or, you know, on the ground who are, who are trying to run their own farming well, business or making a living? Um, in addition, there's rules around things like, for example, genetic modification and genetic engineering, and I think about some of the things uh, that that we do, some of the science that we do, um, that you're not currently allowed to um, put into the pasture in New Zealand. So some of our work with Epichloe uh, uh, endophytes um, to reduce toxicity, uh, to reduce uh, staggers, for example. Um, some of the work around uh, genetically modified ryegrass to reduce methane emissions uh, or, and increase productivity as well as a, as a slight side benefit. Um, and, yet, and yet we can't grow those in the field. And there's, there's, there's government decided policy and regulation around that. And I don't know whether New Zealand is brave enough to have the national conversation about how do we do this trade off? You know, when it comes to genetically modified ryegrass, are we willing to say, actually, that's something we're willing to have in our pasture because of the impact that that will have on our global uh, methane emissions? Um, I don't know how we begin to have that discussion, except that we need, keep, need to keep saying to government, let's have that discussion. So um, so there's, there's that. Um, and, there's, and on top of that, there's, there's government's own approach to thinking about um, agriculture. And sometimes I get the feeling that for some in Wellington agriculture, the fact that we're an agriculturally based nation is a little bit embarrassing. And they'd rather that we were a, an, a nation full of people who were doing, you know, live on stream gaming and a big, you know, inventing AI products and what's the next big industry for New Zealand and maybe government should invest in that and frankly my personal view is we we're world class at agriculture you are world class at agriculture at pastoral agriculture at forage and why on earth aren't we really um, haven't we won the battle to say making us better and better is a great investment for government as opposed to hunting around for you know some some new shiny toy why not just take the thing that we're already acknowledged internationally and continue to fund making it better and better and I think um I think uh, those are conversations that in my role that are pretty critical to keep having and and that you get good traction with that in Wellington and we'll keep having those conversations too so ag research we've got a long proud history um working in forage science the end of fights work that I talked about um, a while ago is a very good example of some of the really groundbreaking stuff we've done there, and I look forward to continuing to do that. Um, we can't do that on our own. We need to partner. We need to partner with you in the field and with business and with government. Partner promiscuously. That's, I think, probably a fairly good uh, core value that I think that Ag Research should have. I mean, I'm, I'm still, look, I've only been there for, for coming up four months. So I'm still in my own head kind of building the scaffold of understanding of what egg research is, what the sector needs, what's working, what's not working. Um, most of the people I talk to, I get to talk to some key big wigs in industry. I get to talk to my staff easily and they've been remarkably generous with their time and sort of briefing me. But I'm really happy to hear from you as well. My email address is sue.bidrosa.agresearch.co.nz. 
And, and at this point in time, everything I hear is grist to the mill. And the more I hear and the more diverse viewpoints I hear, the better I will be at my job. So please feel free to email me anytime. And I, I really will read the emails. Seriously, I get a lot of emails. So it might take me a few days. So don't write me off. Um, but I really, you know, the, as I say, the more viewpoints I have, um, the better I'll be. And I genuinely mean that. So I thank you very much for having me as a member. And that's me. That's it. Thank you. I was just remembering to turn on my microphone because for those of you who were here last week, you remember that I spoke eloquently and probably one of the best introductions I've ever done and I didn't have my microphone turned on. So anyway, thanks, Sue. Thank you very much. Um, look, you're going to hang around for a wee while. We've got a couple other speakers we're going to tick through and then we'll, we'll come back with a bit of a panel discussion and, and panel questions in about uh, 20 minutes time, I think. But look, we will keep... Um, ticking along. Um, as I said, this Slido's there, put your questions in. If you didn't get the QR code before, have a look in chat here on Zoom and you will see it, uh, the URL that you can type in and go directly. But now, all working and yep, I can see she's sitting there. Um, from one um, Dunedin or, or, or yeah, was a CEO in Dunedin to another CEO from Dunedin and we've got Anna Campbell from Abacus Bio joining us for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So Anna, I can see you there. Looks like you're ready to go. Are you able to share your screen and fire away? Sure. And it's away. Thank you. Oh, well, cool, Mario, everybody. I, uh, it's great to be here and join you from sunny Dunedin. I... I have quite a short uh, time today, 10 minutes, and in my usual optimistic way, when I was asked to give this presentation, I said that my topic would be cutting through complexity. And then when I thought about actually cutting through complexity within 10 minutes, I realized just how ambitious I had been. So <clears throat> I've slightly twisted my presentation to something that I'm uh, really passionate about and something that I think um, our industry needs a wake up call around. So we're, we're all aware, we're in the industry, we're reading the media, we're reading social media, we're, um, we're, we feel like, and our farmers feel like they're being hammered from every angle. We're seeing uh, a huge rise in uh, veganism in the US, for example, with something between like 20, 30% of uh, people under 30 um, claiming to be either vegetarian or veganism. Um, we're feeling the pressure around our New Zealand, locally around our New Zealand waterways. We're also feeling pressure around greenhouse gases. We're, uh, we've been thrown these thrown concepts around things like regenerative farming. And, and I know there's some discussion about um, the lack of science behind some of the, the practicalities around regenerative farming. We're talking about plant, there's, there's a lot coming at us. And in terms of thinking about how we um, navigate our way out of this, I, I really want to talk about one topic um, that will help us do that. But just, I guess, to demonstrate some of the complexity, um, I think we're, we're kind of hung up in the developed world that there's going to be a reduction in protein consumption, and yet the statistics don't actually back that up in terms of what we're seeing in developing worlds. We're seeing um, massively increased demand in uh, protein consumption and that is increasing you can see from uh, the bottom graph there that that is directly related to the GDP per person so as a country becomes more wealthy their access and want willingness to eat protein <clears throat> is much is much higher and the, for those of us in the industry we understand the health benefits of protein and understand why people want to eat more uh, animal-based protein so we're pretty clear around that and, the, and, and I think in a, in a developing country context um, they haven't lost sight of that whereas I, I believe we've lost sight of that uh, as developed countries. Um, I had a colleague that I traveled a lot around uh, China with and she was telling me that when she grew up as a child she lived in quite a, um, a, a small town her par parents were factory workers and they would eat meat once or twice a year as a festival um, occasion and she was only in her 30s uh, now she says she eats meat on a daily basis so that gives you the kind of um, idea of how massive this shift has been in quite a short time and quite frankly from a New Zealand agricultural point of view 
uh, that the shift in protein consumption in, in countries like China has been absolutely vital for our economy. Uh, so it's not just New Zealand agriculture, it's actually the New Zealand economy. And we won't uh, get into how vital that is right now for our country. Um, so, so we understand these kind of complexities, we understand what's going on. At, at, on the same breath, we're seeing some of the new trends and, and getting frustrated with the lack of, um, I guess, criticism is not the right word, but uh, if you were live, you'd be able to tell me what the right is, but the, I guess scrutiny is a better word. The lack of scrutiny really around some of these new products. And here's an example, this is almond milk, which if you can see in the ingredients, the almonds actually make up 2.5% of the, this particular container of milk. And I worked out that if an almond weighs somewhere between 1.8 and two grams, this particular container of milk, which costs six or $7, uh, has about 20 almonds in it. So you're paying, you know, quite a lot of money for very little nutritional value, essentially 20 almonds and water. Uh, and that's what we're getting sold as a milk and a high nutrition product. And we're not, we're just not um, having these conversations and challenging these kind of uh, products enough. Um, on the, on top of that, this is an almond farm in California. When California were having droughts a couple of years ago, they actually saw their table land sink um, a couple of feet with the amount of water that was coming out to uh, produce these almonds. Huge amount of uh, great big water footprint, uh, also damaging to bees. It's not all hunky-dory in terms of these plant-based products. Um, I know I'm preaching that to the converted here, but this is another one that just that, that I find immensely frustrated in terms of thinking about agriculture's, uh, agriculture's carbon footprint. I calculated after reading some um, scientific literature that one week when I had to go to a meeting in Melbourne, the, the carbon footprint of going from Dunedin to Melbourne and back in that one week, I would have to be a vegetarian or a vegan for one to two years to mitigate that carbon footprint. And I, and I think those kind of numbers, those kind of stats are really important to talk about because it starts to put things into context. And, and yet, if I, if I look at what's happening in New Zealand in terms of the community, the government, all our focus is around livestock and, and, and its carbon footprint, and we have very little focus around uh, tourism and its carbon footprint, because uh, essentially flying um, sits outside our national footprint. So I, 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 along with all of you, get very frustrated with some of these uh, hypocrisies, if you like. And when I was sort of thinking about what I was going to talk about today, I uh, reflected on a conversation that I had relatively recently with a journalist in a car park. So I bumped into this guy in a park, car park and he said something to me, which was really interesting. First of all, he said, Anna, you know, what have you got? Have you got some interesting stories? Have you got some interesting projects that you can tell us about? And I said, sure, sure. Um, come up and we can, um, and I can introduce you to some people and we can talk about some of the projects we're doing. And, and the same sentence, he then said, look, I'm, I, I'm really finding it hard to talk to scientists these days. I can't access uh, scientists the way that I used to, agricultural scientists. And <clears throat> he gave the example, he's a Dunedin man of, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, he would be able to go out to AgriSearch on, on a week, um, weekly, almost fortnightly basis and talk with scientists and, and get their stories into the media. And now he very rarely goes out there. And I said, is it a, and you know, is it a lack of being invited? Is it, is it, and, and we, did, we didn't really get much further, but I thought that was a, a very interesting comment that he didn't believe he, he had access to scientists in the, in the way that he would have in the past. So why, why is that important? Um, I think with COVID, we've learned that it's absolutely essential that we hear the science voice. And we've been told, I think, by social media and by media that the reason that people don't, or the reason a science voice is not being heard is because people are anti-science. Whereas I think what we've learned with COVID is that people are actually incredibly receptive to rational, well-expressed information. And we need to be the ones that are distributing that information. And quite frankly, um, scientists are right now, agricultural scientists in New Zealand are almost invisible. They're not talking to the media. We're not putting our stories out there. If we are putting our stories out there, they're kind of in a an organizational promotional form that's not necessarily what consumers want to read. And we're in this world of incredible fast communication, incredibly, we can reach numbers of people, we can really put messages out there. Uh, and at the flip side of that, 
our agricultural scientific voice is being lost. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to throw a few daggers here and uh, I don't apologize for that. And, and I, I also understand the reasons why, why organizations are nervous around letting scientists um, speak to the media. And I had a, a very robust debate with uh, someone within the Institute of Directors around this because their, their mandate was in terms of their teaching of who should be communicating with the media was that the only people who should be speaking to the media of any organization is the chairman or the CEO. And I, I completely disagreed with her. And we had an extremely robust debate around it. And um, for me, there has to be some sort of level of trust within your organization that you allow scientists and other um, people within your organization to speak to the media. So I think there's a there has been a movement in New Zealand um, that's come from the boardrooms that is not allowing people to speak to the media. And um, I find that really, really disappointing. And I'd like to challenge that. Uh, on top of that, we've also got funding structures that mean um, sometimes every, every time we want to talk about a project, we have to go through five layers of management to be able to speak about that project. So you just don't bother. And obviously IP considerations. And around the IP considerations, I just, I'd just like to really comment here that you know, 90% of the work that scientists, agricultural scientists do in New Zealand uh, is not protectable and, not, and, and it is not necessary to protect. So again, I, I really challenge um, that, that a lot of the work that we're doing is not shareable um, with farmers and our wider community and our urban community. So to, I guess to pull it to a close, in my view, uh, communication does need to happen far more widely than it is for us to have a genuine voice and to talk about agriculture and talk about the complex challenges that agriculture is facing, but also to talk about some of these, um, hypo you know, these um, contrasting or these slightly hypocritical uh, messages that are coming out through government and other mainstream media. Uh, the communication that we need to be um, putting out there needs to be rational and well thought out, it needs to be multidisciplinary. So we need to be hearing from geneticists, we need to be hearing from engineers, we need to be hearing from psychologists, we need to be hearing from the full gambit. Um, the next point is just so important to me. Uh, we, we need to hear at, from people at multiple levels of expertise, not just CEOs. And um, I am a CEO and in, in my views often, often hearing from CEOs can be quite boring because we can be quite vanilla because we're representing our organization. Actually, we need a little more color than just a CEO or a chairman. Um, the, what the communication needs to underpin, underpin industry direction and needs. And sometimes, and I think we have to accept this, sometimes our scientists will come out with data or messages that contradict each other. And that's okay. It's part of a robust debate that we need to put agriculture at the forefront of people's minds. Um, communication needs to be funding independent. And I know that will be a challenge for some organizations. And I also believe that communication needs to be organization naked. We need to start shaking off the fact that I come from Abacus Bio, Sue comes from AgriSearch, so-and-so comes from, Aaron comes from Beef and Lamb. We actually need to be talking about our industry and not worrying about the organization that we represent. So in my view, uh, greater communication from all of us will lead to a greater understanding of the complexities and challenges that we are facing within agriculture, greater support for what scientists can do to cut through that complexity and find solutions as we've seen with COVID-19 from hearing from scientists with a different range of views, we've actually been able to come up with a solution for New Zealand that people have trusted our government to implement. And I believe that it will also lead to a greater trust in agricultural scientists and New Zealand farmers and what they're trying to do. So my challenge as I finish is that uh, I strongly believe that every scientist before they turn the age of 30 should have done a minimum of five media interviews. Over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Anna. All right, so while I, if you can stop sharing your screen or one of the team will do that. And Thomas, our next speaker, if you're there, you should be able to start sharing your one across. So a slight change of um, tone, I guess, in terms of where we're going with our, our next presentation. Um, we've had Sue talking about ag research and her role there, Anna talking about Abacus Bio and some of her thoughts about the future. But now we're back to, I guess, something that's more the bread and butter um, no pun intended, of the, the Grasslands Association, which is um, 
talking about a pastoral industry and in particular uh, sheep milking. So look, welcome, Thomas. I can see you've shared your screen. I think you're all unmuted. So you should be able to fire away and introduce yourself and um, talk to us for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Kia ora, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas McDonald. I'm the general manager of milk supply for Spring Sheep. And uh, a couple of months ago, Dave Stevens asked if I'd come and share with you this afternoon. And I said, what would you like to know, Dave? And, and he said, look, Spring Sheep's been on a journey, you know, from, from literally from a, a bare paddock to a global consumer leading brand. And, and part of that journey has been significant amount of R&D at farm level and at consumer level. And so this afternoon, I'm going to share a little bit of that journey and uh, the time we have and um, a bit more of the context around why we do what we do at Spring Sheep. For those of you who don't know Spring Sheep, our why, why we get out of bed every morning is to be um, the premium source of nutrition for consumers uh, in the first thousand days around the world, particularly those that struggle with uh, digestion issues or intolerance to traditional bovine dairy. And I think more to uh, Anna's point and following on from that, one of the other ways to communicate is through brands. And often uh, for us as primary producers, we forget that ultimately all of our produce, all of our science on farm, all of our farm systems research actually ends up towards a product in market dealing with consumers. And one of the biggest voices that uh, consumers has is the brand. And the first lesson we've taken as we develop Spring Sheep is that no matter what we do, whether it be in genetic research, be it in farm research, it all ends up contributing towards a brand which derives value for our farmers. And that's um, something that's really important to consider for us, I guess, in the pastoral industry as scientists and researchers that um, we all end up in a consumer facing product at some point in the journey. Spring Sheep was started in 2015. Uh, and this is the journey uh, that we took. This was a starting position. It was a bear paddock. Uh, this is down in the Ripara region. And I guess when you do start with a bear paddock with no fences, no milking parlour, no sheep and no people, uh, but the, the passion and the intention to build a sheep milking business, the world truly is your oyster, but you do need to put some framework around it. And from day one, we've said, uh, as we build a New Zealand sheep milking industry, we will be led by data and informed by research. And it's been a fundamental part of our journey. The first thing that was required is obviously the sheep and uh, many of you have been around for a number of years will know in New Zealand we do wool and we do meat really well. We've traditionally not done dairy genetics for sheep very well. On um, the left of your screen you'll see a traditional New Zealand ewe capable of producing between 90 and 150 litres of milk per annum. As we progressed through the industry we looked around globally and we saw that um, yes there was a sheep dairy industry globally. Uh, yes they were capable of producing sort of over 400 litres of sheep but often uh, in farming systems that were not akin to New Zealand. And so part of our research and data and inquiry into sheep milking has been, how do we access these genetics? How do we bring them into a New Zealand uh, pastoral system? And how do we adapt them to our environment? And I guess the answer lies in, in this graph and a picture paints a thousand words. So this, um, you can see five lactations here of our dairy sheep as we've built spring sheep. You can see those lactation curves on the bottom have a very low peak. Uh, and they don't milk for very long, funnily enough, and that was the Romney influence in those genetics. As we've been able to access uh, a wider array of genetics, particularly from Europe, and as we've refined our farming systems through research and data, you'll see we've been able to double the peak of those lactation curves. Probably most importantly, we've been able to extend the days of milk by about an additional 70 days out to about 240 days of milk. This has been really fundamental and Spring Sheep have partnered with the team at Genomes New Zealand or Ag Research. We've got a wonderful partnership there. And what really drives this is about 30 million individual animal traits recorded sitting in behind our flock of sheep. And that's led to what we now call our Zealandia breed. And so what we've done as an industry, we've taken sheep, we've used um, strong data points, we've used leading genomic research, stabilised a breed of milking sheep for our New Zealand farmers and got them out there performing, leading to increased and better returns for our New Zealand farmers. As you can imagine, and you all know, that breeding is not everything. Um, breeding and feeding together are really what drives performance on farm. And uh, you'll see in this picture there, we turned the bare paddock of dirt uh, into what was New Zealand's sort of first real large scale modern sheep dairy farm. Uh, and you might notice there that there's a big white barn in the middle and that was purely built to adapt those European genetics back to the New Zealand conditions. We had a couple of choices, um, bearing in mind that most small ruminants around the world, even in New Zealand, are milked uh, from an indoor 
based farming system. That's something that wasn't really aligned to us, remembering that we're a consumer fronting brand and also remembering at heart we're New Zealand dairy farmers. We love the idea of building a, a pastoral industry based on ryegrass and clover. So it led us to a couple of options. Wanting to be informed by data and science, we needed to take quite a methodical approach to how we build and develop our farming systems. And that's exactly what we did. So this graph here, you'll see a whole lot of little dots scattered around a map of a farm. The red box represents where our milking parlour is and the blue box represents a housing barn. You'll see the photo on the right uh, has no sheep in the housing barn uh, and the left, sorry, and the photo on the right has sheep and there's little dots in the housing barn. And it was really interesting when we put pedometers on sheep, milk meters uh, on the sheep and measured the different mobs. We found that the sheep in the hybrid system where they had access to ryegrass and clover as well as shade and shelter from the barn through the heat of the day actually significantly outperformed the sheep that were indoors all of the time. And being a consumer leading brand again, linking it back through to where we derive our value from, it was really important from a welfare point of view and a consumer image point of view that we measured how um, the sheep were performing in each of these mobs and what was their social structure like and, and I guess um, what we what we partnered with Ag Research to determine was what was the welfare index for these animals and I'm really pleased um, to sort of report back now re reflecting back on five years of growth in the industry that maintaining a pastoral base to our system is both good for animals, good for consumers and great for our farming teams in terms of overall performance. There's been a number of other key areas that have been a, a big focus for us in our R&D to name a few. Um, as an infant formula business looking to, to sell, I guess, premiumized infant formula to the world's most discerning consumers, the whole issue around separation of a, a newborn animal from its mother is a really big um, issue. It's one of the big ones in dairy that's um, facing dairy globally at the moment. And we looked as a sheep dairy industry and we said, well, every other sheep uh, or lamb born in New Zealand is associated with its mother for at least uh, sort of 70 to 90 plus days. And as is a sheep dairy industry, uh, we don't necessarily need all of the milk from the ewe to drive a su successful industry. And what we've been able to do is uh, partner with our farming teams and ag research, and we've completed uh, New Zealand's largest trial to date around natural rearing in a dairy system, whereby we share the milk with the ewe. So for the first 35 days, our farming team set about leaving the lambs on the mothers, and we wean those lambs early between 35 and 45 days, and we're able to then start milking the ewe for a, a commercially viable uh, dairy system. And so. This leads us to a point where the New Zealand sheep dairy industry based on this uh, world leading science could be one of the few dairy industries in the world that doesn't face the separation of a young newborn animal from its mother. And we're looking forward to continuing to partner with Ag Research as we develop those trials. I think the other major lesson around on-farm R&D and building an industry was the fact that um, extension is such a massive part of what we do and New Zealand farmers love to touch it, see it, smell it um, and kick the tires on it. And that led our strategy around development of pilot farms. And so today we operate three uh, R&D farms or pilot farms, and they're all catered to a, a different aspect of our New Zealand farming system, be it outdoor farming or hybrid farming, or in particular, the one that's taking a lot of traction at the moment is our bovine to ovine conversion model. And so as we've, um, as we've completed a lot of this R&D and, and partnered with um, groups such as Ag Research to actually uh, get underway and get our hands dirty in, in developing this industry, it's been really important that we have a place to, to complete the extension work. On the back of the extension work and on the back of developing the pilot farms, we've been able to go out and develop partnerships with New Zealand farmers and that's probably the most exciting part of the journey to date for me is that Spring Sheep now has four partner farmers. We've got 4,000 sheep out there in the industry and that's a real testament to the fact that the industry has been built on data, science and, and developing the fundamentals of the genetics in the farm system to a point where we're able to now partner with uh, your traditional New Zealand dairy farmers and solve problems for them around succession, around environmental sustainability, around uh, optimization and utilization of stranded assets, and as well get them out of the commodity cycle and drive a real premiumized farm gate return. Now, all of this, as I mentioned, is really important to be put in uh, a consumer mindset. And it, again, the farm systems work is only but one part of what we do. Partnering this with uh, our in-market team is, is really important. And so we partner all our farm systems work with our consumer work, and that's led us to a human clinical trial uh, where we've actually proven the digestibility benefits of sheep milk for our consumers. So taking all of that farm system research, partnering with farmers and joining it to a real true premiumized market strategy is what we're about. So thank you very much, Aaron.
Excellent, Thomas. Excellent timing. I just turned on my camera there. You may have seen just to give you the one minute warning. Hey, look, so we've been through our three speakers and what we're going to do, if you can stop sharing your screen, Thomas, and then we're going to have Sue and Anna and Thomas all online for a panel discussion. We've had a few questions come in. There've been a few upvoted. Um, the most popular one, but you don't need to answer it, Anna, is actually they want to know the name of the journalist you were talking to in the car park, but we can deal with that offline. Not, not in a... Uh, not in a who was it, let's get them uh, point of view, but it would be good to engage with them directly. So uh, look, Sue, first question will be to you. I guess um, your role as head of ag research um, is fairly significant. And the question is just in your in your day-to-day -day role or in, and now you're getting, uh, going around meeting people, do you find that science has been taken seriously by the people in the ministries and so on that you're meeting with? Um, or are they more led by polls and politicians and policies? I and mean, is it just lip service or is it um, serious commitment to the things that AgriSearch, for example, might find out? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. I think there are people in both the Ministry for Primary Industries and MB that are passionately committed to good science. Um, I think there are some that think that science should be finding New Zealand's next big industry rather than making the fabulous industry we've already got better and better. And look, I'd have to say I do agree with um, with Anna that I don't think, I mean, I've come into AgriSearch and I'm walking around, I'm meeting scientists, I'm getting really excited about the research we're doing and I'm saying to person after person, I didn't know this was happening. My mum doesn't know this is happening. My next door neighbour who's a passionate greenie and has gone vegan because she thinks it's going to save the planet doesn't know this is happening. We are not good at this and actually listening to Anna I sent a note off to my comms manager saying, I want a very simple process where we can empower any of our scientists to talk to the media. And then I want you to start a program of getting in touch. Let's start sharing this information because people need to know that this sector is passionately committed to getting better and better. And certainly places like MPI and quite a lot of people at MB really, I think really do get this. Brilliant. So that's probably a good segue into um, a couple of questions for you, Anna, that's sort of on the same topic is, is um, thanks for the presentation, fully support the points you made. Uh, the question is where to from here? And the other one is um, probably along the same line. What do scientists need to do? Do they need to learn comms, social media at the same time as they're, they're completing their PhDs or is it people to do it for them? Or how do you, do you deal with that issue you raised? Yeah, so there's a, there's a huge variety of courses and things that scientists can do in terms of getting more comfortable in that in that type of situation. And, and they can be run in-house. Uh, there's organisations like Toastmasters, which just get you more comfortable in that kind of impromptu situation. And I think companies need to do what they can to support people to put themselves out there. So as Sue said, you know, not make it difficult so that, you know, there's not five layers of tick off if you get asked to do an interview. Um so, yep, so training and, and just, you know, it's actually not that hard to talk to media because often they're often they're, they're looking for a few sound bites. So it's really that preparation before you go into, into an interview, having that one main message and a couple of minor messages and, and knowing that you're able to repeat them uh, that, that allow you to feel confident um, in, in role playing, you know, practicing. If we ever have any young uh, young people going into their first media interviews, we would do a, a practice run with them so that they, they just feel that they're prepared for that. And it's like anything, uh, the more you practice, the better you get at it. And the only way you get good at it is by doing it. What about, just as a follow up on that, what about the, you, I think you mentioned it too, the trust issue though. Um, how do you, I mean, you, you can talk about it, I guess, specifically for advocates, but um, your thoughts for industries are how do you, how do you get people, yeah. I guess, in charge to trust that they can let scientists speak to the media? I think, I think, and I, it just, like, I guess what I find a little bit frustrating is that there's a, a sort of a lack of trust and yet all of us can go and write whatever we want on social media. So, um We've got to we've got to trust the bigger messages to go out because we can't we actually can't control things the way that we're used to be able to control things, and so if we provide the right training, then and and people are feeling like they're not muted, they're feeling like they can be open about what they can do and they're open about their concerns, then we have to trust that they have enough integrity and enough pride in, in their job and what they're doing that they will um, present well. Thank you. Right, we're getting a few questions coming now. People have obviously warmed up. So um, one for you, Thomas. Um, 
as organizations scale, they can move from being data and science driven to being marketing driven. Um, and you talked about where Springsheep are and the importance of data and science driving you. How will Springsheep keep its curiosity as it grows? Yeah, fa fantastic question. And, and I probably um, think that marketing driven has been part of what we've been from day one. And I think um, that remains a key driver of um, Spring Sheep. So I don't think um, that's necessarily a bad thing would probably be my comment there. Um, as it grows, we have marketers sitting on our genetics steering group and we have geneticists sitting on our marketing group. Um, that's core to the DNA of who Spring Sheep is. And I think that um, curiosity is one of our key values. It is what we do. And I don't think you can be in a, a new industry and pioneer it um, without that curiosity. And it's something that um, maintaining that cross-functional um, sort of network in our businesses is key to our growth going forward. And I think this one sort of ties in with that question. It's some, you, you talked about some of the R&D you're doing and you mentioned the environmental stuff. Do you have a handle on the environmental footprint of, of sheep milking compared with other pastoral uses in New Zealand? Yeah, we do. Um, we've done a lot of um, preliminary work with the team at Ag Research. I see a couple of names on the call here who have been instrumental in supporting that work. And um, there's a foundational study completed at the farm down in Rekara there where we placed 300 suction cups underneath the property. And um, we sort of measured the farm under various grazing formats, whether we had um, sheep sort of grazing full time or hybrid grazing in a duration control system or indoors. And I guess from a data desktop point of view, we'd say preliminary, there's about a 33% reduction based on a comparatively stock dairy unit um, with the sheep on a full-time grazing basis at the moment, but a lot of further work required to validate that further in different soil types, as you can imagine. Okay. So does that mean, and this, this is another question that's come in then, uh, how does sheep milking see itself? A competitor for land, for dairy, an alternative for existing sheep and beef farmers? We, we, what's the target? What's the pitch? I think primarily when we talk to people, this is a dairy industry and a dairy business that um, probably still lends itself to dairy land first and foremost. So that's the, that's the first conversation to have there. Um, competitive, no. So um, sheep dairy is a premiumization in terms of the in-market position. So um, we see ourselves as a, a probably more of the alternate dairy category out of the mainstream and the premium sort of solving a niche um, nutritional opportunity for a consumer. If we bring that back to New Zealand from a land use point of view, um, this isn't going to be 10,000 farmers across uh, New Zealand committing to it. This is going to be um, niche um, for high value land around suitable manufacturing assets. And so, no, we don't see this as every dairy cow farmer being pushed out of the industry over the next wee while. It's an opportunity for those top farmers to diversify their businesses and, and create stable, long lasting return. Okay. So, and I'll just follow up on that one because it still ties in. So, your, your, your um, target audience, if you like, or the people that are likely to adopt are those with you know, high level of dairy and skill and what's the um, pathway into the industry? Are you limiting how many people, or does the sheep milking industry limit how many can enter or is it potentially quite open-ended? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic question you've asked, Aaron. I think we, we answered that in three ways. So when we set Spring Shape up, the first thing we said was uh, we are a demand-led industry that will backfill with supply, recognising that New Zealand's been pretty bad at this in the past. You know, we've crashed a lot of industries in their early foundational days by thinking that it's a number eight wire. Everyone's got a digger and a conversion plan, uh, and then we'll figure out a marketing strategy after that. So Spring Shape has set a marketing strategy when we know we've got demand and we know we've got processing capacity, we'll then talk about partnering with farmers long term practically what that means is about three or four thousand additional sheep a year for the next five years up to about 40 to fifty thousand sheep in the Waikato is a medium term pathway for the industry brilliant thank you all right sue we've had a couple come in for you it's like um penguins on an ice flow or something once somebody's jumped into slido and asked a question all of a sudden everybody's having a go um so here's one to put you right on the spot given the current increased visibility of science should the gmo discussion be broader than just specific issues like ryegrass yes am i unmuted yes you are yes, it... we can hear you. But, you know, you might as well start somewhere. So um, uh, I look at the some of the work we've got going on with EpiChloe and uh, simple gene editing to simply take one gene out. We're not adding in, a fr we're not making Franken tomatoes or whatever it is that people freak out over, whether you agree with that or not. We're just taking a gene out. It's something that could happen simply by chance, but we'd be waiting 100 years or 1,000 years for that to happen. Simply taking that gene out using CRISPR technology means that the sheep don't, the, the, it prevents creation of toxin that causes sheep, that causes staggers. So um, why wouldn't we do that? It's an animal welfare issue. 
um, I think that's a good discussion. That's an easy one. You can grow that in Australia. We just can't grow it here because our rules are slightly different. And I know those discussions are underway. And then there's other work going on. There's, there's, there's the um, insertion of genetic material so that we grow fatty rye grass, which I spoke about before. There's work, for example, uh, uh, Angus cattle um, with in terms of adapting to climate change, black cattle overheat. And we've got some work going on so that they are not black, so that we have our cattle that previously are black will be brown. Um, and, uh, and that gives them much better heat resistance. That also is an animal welfare issue. So how do we have these conversations about these trade-offs as a country? For sure, some people will say, well, just have a new industry, specialise in rockets, um, have less cows, but that doesn't work for New Zealand economically. And also, if we have this farming, actually the world is in a lot worse position because we do this more efficiently on all metrics than anywhere else in the world. So um, so simply saying, well, we're going to shut it down in New Zealand and make it someone else's problem just isn't an answer. So we do need to have that conversation. Look, it's pretty much guaranteed that the COVID vaccine, when it comes out, will be made using some form of genetically engineering uh, process. We have medications on the market now where you, every piece of soy that you're eating in New Zealand has got, at some point in time, pretty much guaranteed gone through some kind of mechanism to produce it that included genetic modification. But we all pretend that isn't happening because we want to be clean, green New Zealand and because it's a hard conversation to have. I think the country's mature enough to have the conversation, um, but a government has to be brave enough to start that conversation. Okay, look, this next question for you as well. Well, actually, it's a two part one, but um, talking about being having conversations and being brave. Um, the question is that the comment for starters that they're delighted to hear the CEO promoting scientists talking to the media, although I guess that could be both uh, you and Anna. Should CRIs have a similar mandate to universities to be the critic and conscience of society? Um, I don't imagine our CRI scientists by and large see themselves as the critic and conscience of society in a way that academics do. Um, I think, though, that scientists should feel free to talk about their science. And the IP considerations aside, but as Anna said, that's a pretty tiny percentage of what we do. Um, we should talk about the science and we should tell people what it means. We should, we should be willing to stand up for... Um, for scientific findings and when they don't agree and when a, a neighbouring scientist says something else, we talk about that as well. That's the nature of science and the more people hear about that, the better that it is. Um, as Anna will know, coming from Dunedin City Council, which is a particularly vicious place to work, I am in no way frightened to have vicious media conversations or to, for my organisation to take part in those as long as people are behaving with integrity and telling the truth. These are great things to debate in public and uh, the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, I don't think by and large, that's the role that CRIs are set up to do. They're set up to do great science and to make it make it obvious to talk about it. Okay. Well, Anna, do you want to comment on that one? You've been obviously, work, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you've worked for CRI, you're now CEO in the, in the private industry. What's your thoughts on... Uh, what you've talked about and how it applies to, to our CRIs like AgriSearch. I think, I think CRIs probably compared to the university would do more commercial work and there are sensitivities around that and, and certainly at Abacus Bio we deal with that as well. Um, but I, I don't think that precludes scientists from being able to be a voice around uh, complex matters. Um, for example, how greenhouse gas um, carbon calculations are developed within, you know, if, if there is a, a scientist that has a, a different position from what the government is maybe proposing, then I feel that they should be able to be a voice, a scientific voice of reason um, to, to oppose that. So I, I don't think it is, is separate to being commercial. I think, um, and so I think, because remember, you know, when we're, when we're talking about science and when we're, when we're bringing these debates out, we are doing so with evidence. And I think that that's really important that that evidence is heard. And so, yes, I would say, I think, I would hope that, I, you know, I've got 50 people within Abacus Bio and I would trust every single one of them to speak to the media and to represent our industry well and to present evidence well. Um, 
and be a critic if needed. And I think um, I, I wouldn't hold them back from doing that. They And they would also understand any commercial implications of that and be sensitive to that. I, I believe they would. Okay, look, thank you to Sue and to Anna and to Thomas. We're um, up for time in terms of the Q&A and the presentation. So we're going to move on. I'm going to share my screen and this all worked last time. So I'm sure it'll work this time. We've got three videos now, pre-recorded uh, presentations from speakers. All those speakers are also online. So again, we're gonna go through the videos, the presentations, and then we're going to open up for another Q&A. So look, great to see you all using Slido, either putting in a question or voting it up. Um, and that all seemed to work well. So please um, carry on doing that as we're going. And this should work. Let's see, I've just got to make sure I've got the computer sound shared and let's see how this goes. Kia ora, I'm Cameron Ludeman. Now it's pretty common for farmers to select their size of sheep or cattle based on an independent selection tool like the maternal index for sheep or the breeding worth index for dairy cattle. Likewise, there is interest from farmers in tools to improve selection of cultivars of grass for their farm. The dairy industry, for instance, developed an independent tool to help farmers decide what cultivars of ryegrass are most suitable for them. This is known as the Dairy NZ Forage Value Index, or FVI. Of course, forages are just as important in a sheep and beef context as they are for dairy. So Beef and Lamb NZ were interested in assessing the feasibility of adapting the Dairy NZ FVI framework to a sheep and beef situation. As part of this broader feasibility project, my published article describes the effect on rankings of cultivars of perennial ryegrass when sheep and beef specific economic values were included in a Dairy NZ FVI framework. Now to understand the work in the article, I need to give you a bit of background to the Dairy NZ FVI framework. It uses data from ryegrass trials across New Zealand and estimates the performance of cultivars relative to a group of older cultivars commercialised before 1996, whereby we call this group of cultivars the genetic base. How well cultivars perform as compared to the average of the genetic base cultivars in a trait is called its performance value. Cultivars can't just be ranked based on trait performance value alone, as for instance, extra dry matter yield in one season may be of different value to a farmer in another season. So in the Dairy NZ FVI, the trait performance values are weighted by what are called economic values. These trait economic values are estimated based on models of a farm system to assess what changes in farm operating profit occur when you get a change in the trait, say an extra kilogram of dry matter. The FVI is then estimated as a dollars per hectare per year value based on multiplication of the trait performance values and economic values, which can be used to rank those cultivars with the dairy industry using a one to five star rating system. The novelty in my article was the creation of sheep and beef specific economic values based on a model of the Otago Southland breeding finishing farm class from Beef and Lamb NZ's farm class survey data. I used the change in livestock production method to estimate these sheep and beef specific economic values for the seasonal dry matter trait. So I had to consider how the change in seasonal dry matter production affect farm operating profits. When the economic values were crunched in the Dairy NZ FVI framework, results in my study indicated that use of sheep and beef specific economic weightings for the seasonal dry matter trait did result in different rankings and cultivars as compared with using dairy trait economic weightings. The changes in rankings can provide us with an indication of the value of a sheep and beef specific cultivar selection decision tool. And results of this article can not only help farmers improve their cultivar selection decisions, but also provide better guidance for plant breeders as to which traits to focus on to provide the best on-farm return. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge that this project is part of the Hill Country Futures Programme with funding from Beef and Lamb NZ, MB, Sea Force New Zealand and PGG Rights and Seeds. I'm also grateful for access to data and feedback from the New Zealand Plant Breeding and Research Association and Dairy NZ 
for use of the Darien ZFVI framework. Thanks, Cameron. Cameron, as I said, is online, so please send in questions and we'll come to the, the Q&A session. And we definitely want some questions for Cameron because for those of you that aren't aware, he's based in the Netherlands. So at the moment, it's 5.30 in the morning over there and he's been with us for about an hour. Okay, on with the next, I'm gonna change the order slightly from what we proposed because I've got a wee hiccup with the videos. Hi, I'm Marty Favell. I'm with AgriSearch and the Forage Genetics team based in Palmerston North. Our paper describes a analysis of genetic diversity amongst white clover and perennial ryegrass accessions from the Margot Ford Germplasm Centre. As forage breeding targets swing towards improving climate resilience and environmental performance, we believe this will require an injection of novel genetics that's not present in New Zealand. And the Margot Ford Germplasm Centre is a reservoir of global germplasm collections for perennial ryegrass, white clover and other forages. But they're present in such large numbers that it's been very hard to phenotype those in a strategic manner to identify where the valuable genetics is. So we're trying to develop core collections. So these are uh, small collections of these accessions that capture as much of the species genetic diversity in a manageable subset of that material. And that can be more readily phenotyped than investigated. And we're using uh, genotyping by sequencing or GBS, a new technology to generate DNA markers. And we're using that to characterize the genetic diversity in these collections and using that information to support the development of core collections. In white clover so far, we've looked at 197 ecotypes and we've quantified the genetic relationships amongst those ecotypes using 11,000 DNA markers from our GBS tool. And those are visualized here. And what you can see is quite clear uh, grouping or clustering uh, based on geography. Uh, so if we start up in the group five here, you can see a progression from Central Asia, Azerbaijan, uh, through to the Caucasus. And then over here in group uh, four, we have a large collection of material from the Iberian Peninsula, which most likely represents a, a center of diversity for the species. All of the New World um, accessions from New World countries such as New Zealand are gathered here in these tightly clustered groups, one to three. In ryegrass, we're able to analyze 357 ecotypes um, here we generated 150,000 DNA markers and used those to describe the genetic relationships amongst the ecotypes. And as with white clover, you can see a clear geographical alignment of material. Uh, if we ignore group one here, which turned out to be annuals or hybrids, starting at group two, uh, we move through uh, Central Asia, the Caucasus, Cyprus and Greece. Moving westward, uh, we come to material from Italy and then the Iberian Peninsula, and we have a pretty underrepresented group of uh, Western and Northwestern Europe derived material here as well. New Zealand occupies uh, some very tight clusters, groups seven and eight, uh, and within those clusters, you can see very short branch lengths, which reflect a relatively low genetic diversity uh, within the clusters. So our analyses show relatively narrow genetic diversity within New Zealand adapted materials, and it's contrasted against quite extensive global diversity in both species. So we'll be extending our GBS analysis to include hundreds more ecotypes in both species uh, and filling those quite obvious geographic gaps that we currently have. And then we'll use that information to support the development of core collections, which we can then phenotype for these critical environmental traits that we're interested in. Where we identify uh, high value or novel genetic ecotypes, we'll use a process called pre-breeding to integrate those novel ecotype genetics into New Zealand adapted elite backgrounds from which we can develop cultivars. Thanks for your attention. Hi. Hi. All right. Do work. Now I've just got a slightly changed format here, so bear with me while we just tick this across and get things set up because it goes on different screens on my laptop which had caused me some issues last time I was trying to get going so we're here in just a couple of seconds and as we said please feel free to um, send in those questions Slido is up and running now PowerPoint slideshow should be to 
And if that's worked, you should now see Vicky Burgraf up on screen and we'll hit play. Tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Vicky Burgraf, a scientist in the Farm Systems team at Agri... sound Aaron. Yes, now this has got me confused. Let's see what's happening. Hang on two seconds. Nope, not that one. Uh, I knew this was going to happen. This is the final presentation of... Let's try this again. Search based at Ruakura. Today I plan to introduce you to a new research area we're delving into called the circular bioeconomy and how the principles could be applied to New Zealand pastoral farms. So first, the current situation shown on the left. We have finite resources, and it's becoming obvious that we cannot continue to take resources, make something, use it a few times and throw it away. This linear way of living is also putting pressure on our environment. The circular bioeconomy, shown on the right, aims to move industry away from this linear model to one where waste and pollution is designed out of the system, minimising the need for non-renewable resources and where materials are reused and recycled in a more sustainable system. Most examples of circular supply chains are related to manufacturing industries. So, how do we apply circular principles to pastoral New Zealand agriculture? One of the challenges for New Zealand farms is that nutrients are exported in products largely overseas, making it difficult to cycle these nutrients back to the farm. If we look at circular agriculture at the farm scale, the first thing we want to address is, can we change our inputs to be more circular without compromising outputs? So these inputs could be nutrients or energy or water or technical inputs such as infrastructure and consumables and their packaging. The first thing to think about is do we need this input or could we use less of it? For example, can we use less fertiliser and still produce enough feed when we need it? And just as important, can we find an alternative input that is more sustainable that might have a lower environmental footprint without depleting resources? Or we could use a waste stream from somewhere else as a resource. For example, the use of horticultural waste as a supplementary feed. Within the farm system, we want to ensure resources are used efficiently. And there's been a lot of work done previously in this area, uh, such as precision agriculture. If we have any waste products that are no longer of use on the farm, we then want to make sure that they are recycled or repurposed, for example, with silage wrap. And we want to make sure that the practices on farm reduce emissions and reduce the loss of valuable materials such as nutrients and topsoil. Finally, we want to make sure that we maximise the value of the products coming off the farm. So here we don't necessarily mean the monetary value, but for example we want to make sure that food products have a high nutritional value and good shelf life. And we want to make sure that the whole animal is used well, getting not just meat, but valuable byproducts. So New Zealand farmers have a suite of options available to follow circular economy principles, but we need to work across farms and industries to optimise resource use. To do this most effectively, we need appropriate tools and frameworks to assess impacts beyond the farm gate and at the regional to global scale to ensure that gains in one area of circularity do not result in trade-offs in other areas. Thank you. Okie dokie. Sorry for the wee uh, hiccup in there. Um, bit of a problem with running PowerPoint versus this one. So I should, if we should be all go now. And firstly, can you hear me? And are our three speakers online? Cameron, Vicky and Marty, are you all there? Yes. Yep. Yes. Good. That, that's come back. I just had a few hiccups at this end. Hey, look, um, first question. Um, we've got a couple coming in. Please fire them in or vote up the ones you like so we know which one to ask. Um, Cameron, first question for you. Um, 
A, has something like this been done for uh, sheep and beef or dryland type uh, pastures overseas? And any thoughts about how, what the uptake's likely to be? I mean, um, with the variability in New Zealand sheep and beef farms versus slightly more homogeneity, I guess, on, on dairy farms where the, the forage value index stuff seems to have been reasonably valuable. Yeah, so you're, the first question was on um, the use of this in um, countries overseas mm -hmm. in dry land environment. I haven't seen um, this kind of index being used, um, it hasn't been published um, so far in sheep and beef context. Uh, there's others more in the, the dairy context in, say, Ireland and, and um, Australia. Um, and what was the, the other question? Whether they're likely to see... How good's the uptake been in the dairy industry, and do you think it'll be as good in sheep and beef, given sheep and beef farmers the greater variability, or what they believe is greater variability in their farms? Yeah, it's certainly a, a challenge, and, and that's why um, there was a broader range of, um, uh, well, beyond this project, there was a broader range of um, farm systems that were modelled. So while the dairy uh, NZFVI is based on four uh, regions and four models. Um, this project was based on, I think, about 12, or it was, it was quite a few based on the number of farm classes. So that, that aimed to try and um, take into account some of that, that variability. Uh, in terms of the uptake, there was, there was good uptake of the Dairy NZ FVI. Uh, farmers um, like to see that, that independent source of, of information for cultivar selection decision making. So you could imagine there'd be, um, uh, there'd be a lot of interest from sheep and beef farmers as well. And, when I, I spoke to um, farmers at other grasslands conferences, um, sheep and beef farmers were asking when it um, could be coming in. So there was certainly demand there. Brilliant. Thank you. And now Marty, um, next in order, the questions for you. Um, actually, there's two here. There's one, both around the genetic variation. Uh, will the current narrow genetic variation be an impediment to our pastures adapting to climate change? And given the selection and so on that's go on, going on is narrow genetic variation a surprise or is it actually a good thing and that we you know we, we've targeted our pastures for our environment so i guess you yeah, sorry too and there maybe the first one is um is it going to be an, an impediment to selecting for climate change well i think there's a lot of genetic variation within the new zealand um perennial ryegrass germplasm base uh, we know that perennial ryegrass is a very uh, genetically uh, variable species so there's probably um variation there that we can leverage in the short term just by reselecting from within the materials that we have here and which as you point out are actually adapted to our environment and you know we've done previous studies where we've identified um, regions in the ryegrass genome that are associated with improved um, performance under water stress and those those had their origins in uh, New Zealand ecotypes so there's definitely variation there I think the main point of our study is that there is an awful lot of genetic variation out there that we know nothing about, and we don't know whether they're hiding some really valuable traits um, within, within those regions, and we'd like to be able to systematically study and identify where those traits live. Mm -hmm. And so the that, second part think, of the question was... Yeah, um, I, was just, I mean, I guess, is the narrow variability, or, or you, I think you said in there about narrow variability, is that just a consequence of sort of intensive selection and for our environment? Yeah, I mean, I, th I guess it's a reflection of um, a narrow, uh, relatively narrow introductions of material um, through the colonization of New Zealand uh, by Europeans and then con uh, subsequent to that um, adaptation. Um, and I would mention that, you know, it does look pretty small and narrow in the, in the diagram that I presented. Mm -hmm. um, there is still a lot of genetic variation there. And we were not suggesting that we can bring in an ecotype from Turkey and that's going to be the new ryegrass. What we're suggesting is that we would introduce novel traits from those interesting ecotypes into the material that's already adapted and which already grows well here and try and change the performance of, um, of our adapted material in terms of climate resilience, etc. Thank you. Uh, Vicky, next question's one for you, I guess. Um, Sort of a two-parter again, how widely used is the circular economy stuff around the world? And given that, how does the circularity of the New Zealand pastoral industry compare with other countries or, or broader regions like the EU? 
Uh, well, Europe is pretty much leading the way in circular economy, so they've put in even policies in place around um, how they manage waste and things like that, which is helping them and spending lots of dollars on research there. Uh, in terms of New Zealand agriculture, in terms of comparison, that's um, a really good question that we're trying to answer. So you first you need to figure out what are the metrics to determine how circular you are. So we're using tools such as life cycle assessment. So um, it incorporates things like your carbon footprint. So we know New Zealand's very good in that aspect, but there's other tools in terms of circularity that are widely used in um, manufacturing industries. So um, material circularity index, which looks at how much of your inputs are waste streams versus um, mining raw materials and what happens to your waste. So we're trying to look at that at the moment um, and it hasn't been done anywhere else in the world at this stage for pastoral agriculture. So we're trying to interpret that at the moment. So yeah, watch this space really. So we're pretty good at some things, but it's a bit of what's the whole picture and what's the, <laughs> yeah. Awesome, thank you. Hey, we're starting that, um question on genetic variation must have sparked a few few comments, um, Marty. So first one is any idea of a time frame for this type of information to be incorporated into breeding programs? Um, it's difficult to say because we don't know what's in front of us, but I would expect with the use of genomic tools to speed up the breeding process and um, monitor the movement of um, trait variants into elite backgrounds that we could do it within a within a 10 year time frame. Um, so that it becomes a question that moves sort of outside of my um, my organisation and into the commercial breeding um, sphere is that we we would intend to move the variants into elite material and then it becomes a, an op opportunity for breeding companies to pick that up and develop it into cultivars using whatever systems uh, they have in place. Cool. And a couple of questions still for you, Marty. Um, obviously. People are thinking about some of the things or the opportunities in this. Um, do you think you can screen, or why do you think you can screen for nitrogen use efficiency or drought tolerance um, when it hasn't been successful in the past in crops like wheat? Um, I would argue that in some cases there are examples where it has been successful, but I think an important distinction when we're comparing with uh, species like wheat is the amount of genetic variation that we have available to us to leverage. Um, as I said, ryegrass is a highly genetically variable um, species. We have next to no idea about um, what the variation is for things like nitrogen use efficiency or drought tolerance. Um, we're developing tools uh, in terms of phenomics, hyperspectral, uh, LIDAR type sensors that will enable us to screen large numbers uh, and really um, hone in on those, on those interesting variants. So that's probably um, my main response to that question. Cool. Okay, and look here, um, it's been pointed out, probably should ask Cameron another question because he's been up um, at extremely early hour in the Netherlands and stayed on all this time, but there are questions coming in for you, Cameron. Um, what's the, and you may have discussed it a wee bit, I think, but um, give us, what's the time frame with the work? Um, a, when it's likely to be, um, I guess, uh, a tool or an option that can be rolled out there and start being used by sheep and beef farmers and their, their advisors in New Zealand? Yeah, thanks for that, that question. Um, so the dairy industry probably took a couple of years to get things um, get things started with the Dairy NZ FVI. Um, and there was a lot of groundwork broken to, to do that, uh, working with the, um, the seed industry and um, how to um, create templates for farmers. So a lot of that work had been done. So potentially it could be done um, quite quickly. Um, now, it's important to note that this project was part of a broader feasibility study of um, a sheep and beef uh, FVI type um, tool. Um, and so the beef and lamb have um, gone through that and um, it's looking like at this stage, um, given um, the sort of current climate that they're um, probably not in a position to, to fund this um, uh, in the, the short term. So that's kind of a, a question for beef and lamb as to um, you know, at what stage they may want to continue to, to fund this um, to, to take it to a commercial um, stage. Good. I should point out, I'm not involved in any of those decisions, so I didn't just dig myself a hole there, Cameron, but <laughs> hey, look, thanks for giving us a, um, yeah, no, a, the, the honest answer about where that's at and the, the challenges I think we all face at the moment. So, 
Hey, look, um, that sort of, I think, covered off the main questions, certainly the ones that got upvoted the most on Slido. So I will call this session to a close. I'm not sure, Cameron, whether you're just going to carry on with your day's work or going to catch up and a bit of a sleep. But look, Marty, Vicky and Cameron, thank you very much for, A, putting those videos together. It was a wee bit of extra work beforehand and then coming on and waiting to, to answer the questions. So thank you. And we've got a last couple of um, items of business, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just some formal business we need to wrap up. And the first one of those is the annual um, New Zealand Grassland Association's President's Address. So he was here at the start. He's introduced himself. I think you all know him pretty well. But um, again, technology willing, he's there. I can see him. And I think you're going to share your screen as well, Warren, for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes for the um, annual President's Address. Thanks, Aaron. So I trust you can see the presentation and hear me okay? Excellent. Spot on. Thank you. Thank you. Good um, so today I want to talk about transformations and uh, I just wanted to, uh, to um, note with thanks the contributions of, uh, well, not necessarily my co-authors, but some of the material I refer to in this presentation draws upon work that was funded through our land and water. So I'm very grateful to uh, my uh, my co-conspirators in that project at least. Um, but of course, uh, any um, uh, outlandish extrapolations I might make or just flat out errors are mine and mine alone. Okay, come on, go down. Why do I wanna talk about transformation? Um, it is uh, very much the word of the day, the word of the moment perhaps. Um, we have been receiving signals from MB for some time that uh, uh, that business as usual is not enough. That is to say that um, proposals uh, that might in the past have been looked at uh, favorably uh, that focus on cows and grass, that's not enough anymore. They're really interested in driving this transformational agenda. And look, let's face it, uh, AgriSearch's own strap line uh, includes that word as well. But I think there's a great deal of confusion as to what transformation actually looks like. Does it look like that? Perhaps the best way of understanding transformation is to look backwards a little bit and to think about what a transformation looks like, uh, a previous transformation. Perhaps we can agree that um, uh, that has some of the symptoms of transformation at least. So. Um, what I want to look at is just uh, very, very quickly look at the uh, that that really painful period in the 1980s with the withdrawal of those subsidies, so supplementary minimum prices, uh, fertilizer subsidies, a number of other things as well. But in essence, many farming families will look back upon that time um, and remember the pain, um, and also perhaps a little later on uh, also recognise the opportunity. There are a number of families who are no longer in farming, um, who <sighs> outrageous. Um, a number of families who, um, who are no longer farming who just remember the pain. It was a very, very difficult time for New Zealand, uh, for New Zealand agriculture. But of course, necessity being the mother of transformation, uh, there was a real drive for, uh, for efficiencies, for cost reductions. Um, it led to better and, and fitter farm systems. They were better because they had to be. Uh, and that transformation was, was well supported by science and NZGA had a key role in that. A lot of the science that was developed during that period, which um, supported that change in, uh, uh, in agriculture from that time, um, was led by uh, a cohort of um, particularly farm system scientists uh, who really wrote the book or books, plural, on, um, on, on, on what um, on what farming systems could be and should be, and really we've, we, uh, we, we benefit from that knowledge uh, even through to today. So if that was what a transformation could look like, what is transformation now then? And really, it's driven by the same thing. Maybe it's not deregulation this time around. We're really looking at re-regulation um, and particularly around environmental um, uh, legislation. Now, I want to also note uh, that this is um, essentially the same driver. It's, this is around the withdrawal of subsidies. And I'm not talking about financial subsidies in this instance. I'm talking about the uncosted environmental externalities. I well remember a, um, a very terse stand-up conversation between a New Zealand dairy farmer and his Dutch counterpart at the International Grasslands Congress. 
uh, in Sydney a couple of years ago, uh, the New Zealand farmer accused the Dutch farmer of, uh, of accepting European Union subsidies uh, and therefore somehow distorting the market. Um, and in and, and, and that way, it was, uh, it was unfair and Im impure even. Um, the Dutch farmer wasn't taking this um, uh, lying down. Um, and his response was, while I might accept EU subsidies, I also know down to the last euro exactly how much it costs to have my effluent chucked away from the farm and dealt with appropriately. What, ha what happens with your effluent? And this is a cost currently that is borne by the New Zealand community. Now I'd like to start um, with, uh, with this photograph, and, and it's, it's occurred a little bit later in the, in the sequence, but um, I love this photograph. It, it really speaks to who, uh, to who, um, who I am as a New Zealander, my sense of, of self, um, uh, and, and why wouldn't you love it? And, and maybe it speaks to you as well. You know, your cows and grass, a man with a hat, a lake and some mountains, it's brilliant. But of course, there's, there's some disconnections in this photograph, uh, with apologies to be in New Zealand for stealing the photograph, of course. The disconnections are this. The farming system in the foreground is not connected in any way with respect to its nutrient export with the water body in the background. And the farming system in the foreground is not connected in any way with respect to the greenhouse gas footprint, its impact on climate change and the, uh, and the likely snowfall in future. It's every New Zealander's God-given right to swim in any lake, river, stream or beach at any time. And yet, Recently, that's becoming less and less possible. This is the cost of the community that they are increasingly unwilling to bear. And it's not just New Zealand community, uh, New Zealand consumers either that are, that are driving this. Um, there are expectations of New Zealanders, and, and I'm grateful to Jacqueline Roth for pointing this out last week, um, who are expecting all sorts of things, but particularly environmental footprint per hectare, whereas our global customers are really more interested in environmental footprint her mouthful. These are different things. They resonate differently. And even more broadly than that, um, there are uh, governments near and far who have their eyes uh, uh, very closely on the situation. So from a farmer's perspective, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. So I want to talk about three three kind of pathways or three models, if you like, of transformation. The first one, um, and this is the Our Land and Water work, uh, looks at a multi-criteria decision-making framework. So this is an exercise that is undertaken with individual landholders, or if there are, uh, for instance, with a Māori Trust, um, with, uh, with individual um, Māori trustees. And it's a way of understanding the hopes and dreams and aspirations, the values of the people in a decision-making role on those properties. So it's a way of assessing all of these things and all of these questions then divided into these, uh, these principal six domains, if you like. Um, it's a pairwise comparison between each of those questions. So you can move the sliders around on screen depending on how you value one against the other. It's not always obvious actually. And some of these things require a lot of thought. The exercise takes many hours, but ultimately you can then look at the weights for each of those, uh, each of those domains and you can produce a nice diagram like this. So this is uh, from a topo sheep and beef farm. Um, you know, clearly they have come in um, uh, into an environment which is governed by variation five in the Waikato uh, regional plan, um, so that the, there is a hard cap on the amount of nitrate they are, uh, they are allowed to export each year. So obviously regulation is hugely important, the environment's hugely important. Um, but this farmer has chosen to move up the value chain in order to try and create, uh, try, uh, try and generate more value. So clearly market factors are uh, hugely important to this farmer as well. Now we've done this a few times. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight um, three, three different farmers. So you can see the, the Topol farm there. Um, the green farm is a Maori trust. Um, environment is key here. Uh, this is one of the Rotorua lakes, the trusts based um, uh, in that area. Uh, and the lake is Taonga. Um, the social well-being is also really important because this is um, a, a block of land with, um, uh, with pine trees that are due to be harvested. Um, and they're keen on getting whānau back into, the, um, uh, into that property with jobs. Um, the uh, yellow line is for a uh, Hawke's Bay mixed cropping farm. And clearly, um, they are always chasing the next idea, the next thing, the next crop. Um, so knowledge base is critical to that, but really strongly driven by financial performance as well. So three 
farms, three very different sets of values, three very different contexts, and three very different diagrams. And when you do this a few times, it gets complicated. So it's highly context dependent. It's uh, very much driven by the people uh, and by the land. Um, as I say, it's, it's a, a very, very specific, context specific um, exercise. Perhaps the second mode um, of transformation or change uh, is a more conventional workshop. Now, this is with one uh, large corporate, and we invited uh, a wide group of stakeholders, including policy, uh, Forest and Bird were there, um, a lot of the support industries as well, academia. Um, and it was the, the question was really posed, what's the best use of these land resources? What does this farm look like in 10 years or in 20 years time? And it was a, a, a very much a blue sky exercise. And this is the sort of thing that comes out. And I guess the, there's lots of words here, um, but the, the point about it is that it's, it's diverse. There's a diversity of enterprises, a diversity of thinking, a diversity of land uses, and it's all connected. So that's, uh, that was impressive, but this one, this one I like more because it's artistic. It's the same thing though, really. The same point is made here, um, that you've got a, a diversity of enterprises and they're all connected. And more than that, they're connected actually to the community as well, because clearly that diversity of enterprises requires very different sets of skills than you might otherwise expect on a, um, on a straightforward um, uh, dairy farm operation, which this was. So here's the third mode of transformational change, and it's this thing called mission-led agricultural innovation systems. You might pause to reflect on the first two modes, um, because they're so context dependent, it's so subjective, they're also a bit random. Um, it's hard to see that those processes would lead to any sort of change at scale uh, that might be um, necessary to, to really move the dial on these, uh, on these wicked environmental problems that we're facing. So how do we undertake transformational change at scale? And maybe this is the sort of thing that we could look at. It smells a bit big brotherish to me, but it clearly involves uh, the sort of uh, decision-making um, entities that make these sorts of things possible at scale. It's designed to consider explicitly, not just farm scale, but landscape, regional, national scales, uh, to identify those barriers and to look at policy lever settings and to include people who are actually capable of pulling those levers as well. Um, is one of these modes any better than any other? Do we need all of them? Um, this, is, uh, this is very much an open question. So I just want to conclude by just noting the kind of narrative, really. We're coming up against um, uh, some pretty difficult problems, and clearly business as usual is not going to crack it. Um, if I can uh, paraphrase, actually to use one of Thomas's phrase, phrases, um, breeding and feeding might have got us to a certain point, but we need to be doing things differently now. Transformation is a slippery thing. Um, it's subjective, uh, as I pointed out before, it's very context dependent, and maybe we can only truly identify a transformation in the mirror. Which leads me to think that actually, we may already see what farm systems we will need to deliver this new future um, already. Maybe they, uh, maybe they exist already, or maybe they don't. But either way, we're going to need science to uh, to support and underpin that development. Science's role here is to reduce those risks of transformation and to speed up the process. Um, and to do that, uh, science, um, I believe, must be better integrated across an array of disciplines. Um, this is entirely consistent with the message that came out of a recent MB review of the, uh, of the CRI science structure. And it's also entirely consistent with the uh, with the thinking and the actions of the New Zealand Grasslands Association. Um, I'm delighted that, um, I, I, I like to think of NZGA as being a pretty broad church. Um, I'm um, always delighted that we have the uh, New Zealand Agronomy Society, for instance, present at our conferences. Um, and on that theme, I'm, um, I'm very excited that we may have, we're working to having a, a surprise guest at next year's conference in Invercargill. Now, it's uh, still very much in the planning at the moment and the devil is in the detail, but it will again uh, potentially uh, expand the church even more. Uh, and I think uh, we'll be better placed, all of us collectively, to, to look at the future 
and to be confident that we're heading in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. I left my microphone off for a wee while last week, but your phone rang in the middle of the presentation, and I think yeah, that that's Trump's rude. In terms of <laughs> so, don't worry, you Sorry. will pay for that in due course. <laughs> Sorry, I got my because I believe I had a, a sneaky direct message from you when I made that mistake as well. So <laughs> this is just me getting payback. Hey, look, we do have a last couple of um, items. Thank you very much for that, Warren. And this has been recorded for those of you that want to um, catch up on that again and go through Warren's um, presentation. He covered a lot. But I'm going to just ask now Chris Smith, who's chair of the Invercargill Local Organising Committee for the second year in a row, which is some sort of new record for the Grasslands Association with the changes we've had. But next year, they finally, touch wood, get to deliver their conference in Invercargill. So Chris, if you can share your screen and tell us what we're going to be in for next year. Well, I remember when I finished this presentation in front of members in Napier last year, I was thinking we had a nice straight road to the conference in Invercargill, but I was wrong. That road had a pothole in it. So I'm now once again inviting people to join us in Invercargill for the delayed conference. This year, next year, it'll be the 9th to the 11th of November 2021. This is a week later than originally advertised on the website, as once Cycling Southland made their mind up about when they were going to have the tour of Southland, we found we'd booked the same week. The session, th the session themes will be the same as advertised last year, consisting of wintering systems, farm systems for the future, water quality management, sustainable intensification, and forages for the future. On the social side of it, we'll once again have the annual dinner. We will also be visiting the Bill Richardson Transport World, where people will have an opportunity to view the exhibit while dining finger food, highlighting the products of Southland. The field trips are planning to cover a working flax mill and how it is fitted into a modern farm. This farm is right on the coast at Riverton and borders onto the sand dunes and goes from sand dunes up into quite heavy soil types. The second field trip will be visiting the Southern Dairy Hub. This is situated just north of Invercargill and is um, reputed to be the largest research farm of its type in the world with 750 cows run on four completely separate herds. I'll now leave you with a video. If it starts, yep of the Dairy Hub, uh, initially looking at the shed, looking south towards Invercargill, hovering over the shed where it's got extra yards for research purposes, extra backing gates so that three herds can be held in the yard at any one time. And we swing round looking towards the Macaroo River on the bottom floodplain there. And as we swing round, we'll end up looking to the north. And there, thank you for this. And I would hope everyone comes down next year so you can actually get down on the dairy hub kick the soil and see what the exciting research is being done there thank you thanks chris yeah you know, looking forward to finally getting uh, down to invercargill and seeing what you've got down there you've had two years to prepare so it better be one of the best conferences we've ever had all right look um <laughs> there's the challenge hey look uh, we will shortly um just do a quick wrap up i'm going to throw back to warren but firstly if you're still on slido and i think we'll bring it up on the screen we just want a wee bit of feedback um this is something new for grasslands we've um had to make a virtue out of necessity uh running in an online conference it has doesn't have all the features but it has some other benefits and that i think we've got to more non-members and it's certainly a wee bit more more um flexible if you like and it'll be interesting to see how many people view the recordings but on that last note thank you for coming on and i'll just hand over to warren quickly to to sum up and uh, close the the session while you carry on doing those uh slido polls and give us your feedback thank you thanks aaron and yes um just to reiterate that uh, that feedback is really important for us. Um, it, it's up to me then uh, to just close this. Um, I just want to say a few thank yous. Um, firstly, uh, just a huge thank you to the to the speakers um, over the last 
um, uh, today, of course, and last week as well. It's been a, a massive test for us of, uh, of, um, of a new format, of new technology. Um, and I think we've all learned a lot and you've, um, uh, you've, you've been very patient with us and uh, you've demonstrated a, a great commitment to us and we're very, very grateful for that. Thank you. Um, thanks also to the audience. I realize that um, these conferences, uh, these online events, webinars, whatever you care to call them, um, it's a significant test of your patience and attention as well. And so I'm very grateful, particularly for those who have um, remained with us until the end of this. But over the last uh, week or two, we've we've had um, hundreds of people literally um, join us. So we've been um, uh, we've been very lucky. Uh, we've been blessed, and I'm very grateful for uh, for your commitment to us as well. Uh, of course, a big thank you to the Beef and Lamb New Zealand team, uh, without whom none of this would have been possible. Uh, so Laura, uh, Olivia. Briar, uh, and especially Aaron, um, who is just such a superb facilitator. Uh, I'm very grateful to all of you. Um, of course, I would be remiss not to thank um, the, uh, the New Zealand Grasslands Association executive team. This has been such a crazy year, uh, and you've put, put in such, uh, such a lot of work to make sure that this, um, this alternative conference, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, is, uh, is, is successful and interesting and valuable. Um, the local organising committee in Invercargill, likewise, thank you to you. Um, you've been, uh, very, again, very patient. You've had a two-year run-up to a conference. I don't know if that's half the amount of work or twice. Either way, um, we, uh, we're grateful for your continued commitment. Uh, and lastly, um, thanks to a, a big thank you to Ruth Felshaw, who's the uh, NZGA editor, um, who um, saw uh, the, um, the, the refereeing uh, editorial process for the, uh, the papers that you've heard, um, and to Marie Casey, our executive officer, uh, who has been um, uh, such a tower of strength in what's been, as I say, an unprecedented year, as everyone has said. Look, um, a couple of things to finish with. Um, uh, in, in, um, to be consistent with our online um, activities this year, we're holding an online AGM. So the annual general meeting will, uh, to be advised uh, formally, but it will be on the 10th of December, likewise at 4.30 in the afternoon. So for those of you who, uh, who can make it, we look forward to welcoming you there. And lastly, um, just a, a personal thing. I mean, the, the, the two events today, last week, have just been so good, so positive. Um, the content has been so varied and so interesting. The Q&A, I think, demonstrates great engagement. Um, but for me personally, it, 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 it also comes with, um, uh, with almost a sense of loss um, that the, the conference format that we've adopted this year has not allowed us to meet face to face. And I miss that. I really do. There's a there's a great a great deal of value that you get from interacting with people who you haven't seen for a while, talking science, um, renewing friendships, um, making new introductions. All of that sort of thing has had to go by the by this year. And uh, as I say, for me personally, um, and maybe for some of you, it it uh, it does leave a sense of loss. Um, it just makes next year's conference at Invercargill that much sweeter, and I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you very much for that invitation, Chris. Um, and on that note, I shall leave you to your, uh, uh, to your evenings. Um, thank you from the Grasslands Association, and we'll see you in Invercargill.